How wonderful to confess that with Christians throughout church history. Great to see you. Can you open up to 1 Timothy chapter 3? Um, uh, please don't be distracted by the weird chest hair looking thing here. It's a microphone. Zach said, don't pay any attention to it. Don't point it out. So don't look. It's weird. It's uncomfortable. It's... Good morning. We are going to be in... <laughs> First Timothy chapter 4 this morning, we've just read the Apostles' Creed. We were reminded at the end of uh, uh, the chapter uh, 3 of First Timothy of, of a creed that Paul quotes and confesses with the church and gives his apostolic seal of approval. And it says this in First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16, Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. He, that is Jesus, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul is, as he's writing to the local church about leadership, about church discipline, about a a structure of ministry, about how, how the church should function as the household of God, he is reminding us at the end of chapter 3 here, what is the source of our truth? What is the source of our confession that we are meant to be a pillar and buttress of? That truth which we are meant to be a defender of as the church, that truth is the story, the good news, and the message of Jesus Christ, the incarnate God, dead for sinners, alive again, ascended from where he will return in judgment. This is a spirit-born witness. This is a spirit-enlightened witness. This is a spirit-empowered confession that all true Christians hold to. That true churches defend and proclaim the message of Jesus. And it is this message which produces godliness and freedom and liberty in life as we show forth the fruit of the Spirit. But today's passage, as he has ended last chapter, the chapters are not inspired, that's a later division and addition. But nonetheless, the the end of chapter 3 finishes on what the Spirit brings the true church to confess. And he starts chapter 4 with boots on the ground saying, but also there are other spirits. And they lead other people to confess other truths. And instead of defending the truth and being a pillar and a household of God, they are a household of demons and they apostatize from the truth. Let's read chapter 4 together, starting in verse 1, chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. Hear now the words of the one true living God. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by all who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. May God bless this word in our midst to our edification and his own glory. Paul speaks here of the dangers of false confession by false teachers through false spirits. He says here, now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. That's really the the main idea today. Everything sort of branches off that. Who departs from the faith? How do they depart from the faith? Why do they depart from the faith? What does it look like as they're departing from the faith? This is, though, a marker that Paul wants us to understand. He's echoing the teachings of Jesus that in the entire existence of the church, in the best of churches, the most pure of churches, started by the best of church planters, Paul the Apostle, still in those churches, there will be enough impurity not to justify an unregenerate mass, not to vindicate an unbelieving church and we say, oh, it's a a church good enough, no church is perfect. No, not to excuse the failure of church discipline, which requires a true confession of faith and godly living of all Christians, not to excuse any of those things. Yet the reality in the church age, Jesus taught us, is that amongst the crop of wheat that grows by the planting of Jesus Christ, by the word of God in our hearts, there will also be Satan-sown weeds that grow 
And the task of the church is to recognize them, identify them, and in certain cases excommunicate them when they are recognized. And it is also the task of God to, uh, to, to, to help the church. He talks about this in 1 Timothy 5. To help the church notice those false believers by bringing about sinful practices in their lives. Nonetheless, our consideration today is a sober one that not everybody in the church that we see, in this church or others, not every person in the church that we see, even if they confess certain things along with us and wear the Christian name tag and become a member and take communion, not all people that we see in the visible church are truly members of Christ. This is true, very sad to say, for some of us right here today. Some of you have visited and you're not a Christian. We're very glad that you're here, but you've come into a church. The rest of us who confess to be Christians, some of you are not. So you're trying your hardest to put on a facade to keep up the show, but the Lord can see your heart and can see your rebellion and your distance from Him. He still looks at you with all of your sin in your account and He perceives you as somebody deserving rightly His wrath and He will give that to you. No matter how much you profess it in the public of others, no matter how you, you show in the view of others, if you are not truly by faith alone, trusting in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, believing what the Holy Spirit says in the New Testament, and bending your knee to that with Jesus as Lord, if that is not truly you, which will be evident by a godly life and repentance, if that's not truly you, then you are warned today. You are warned today that God knows your state. God sees your rebellion, your secret rebellion to others, but your known rebellion to God. And the warning today is to flee to Jesus Christ to be saved while he is still presented as Savior. Because when you die or if Jesus comes back, Jesus will no longer be Savior of sinners. He will be the judge of all and he will take those he has already saved to glory. Today, Paul's injunction to us is recognize that no matter how healthy a church, no matter how strong our heritage, no matter how good our background or faithful our past are, every church will have from time to time those who walk away from the true confession and belief of the Christian truth. The Spirit expressly says that this will happen throughout the later times. Now, we see that phrase, later times, and some of us will think, when? When is this later time? Uh, are we in the later time? When will the later time occur? Uh, that sounds relative. Who, who, who's to know? Uh, some people, we need to realize that this is going hand in hand with the New Testament language of last day, or last days, or the coming age, or the later times. The last days are not the last few days before Jesus comes back. The last days are not the last few weeks, years, decades, centuries, or even millennia before Jesus comes back. The last days is the entire era between Jesus' first coming in resurrection and Jesus' second coming in judgment and glory. Every day in between those two events can rightly be called belonging to the last day, the latter times. The New Testament uses this language of the last days for this era we live in because it was an Old Testament idea, an Old Testament uh, 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 anticipation that while we, the Jews, are surrounded by enemies and with all of these prophecies about a Messiah to come, we live in this present age. We live in this current age. We live in this day. But when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring a new chapter of history. The last chapter of history, the next chapter of history, when glory comes to earth, and that will be the days of the Messiah, the age of the Messiah, the age of the kingdom, the last days. And what the New Testament shows to us is, though the disciples had to have this beaten through their thick skulls, I've got one of those, those thick skulls that take so long to learn, though Jesus taught them over three painstaking years, what the Spirit drove into them at Pentecost was this realization that this last days would not simply come all at once in full and entire glory. Rather, like Jesus says, it will come as a seed, a mustard seed, and it will slowly grow throughout the world. As the book of Daniel tells us, it will come as a stone from heaven, fall, crush every other kingdom, and eventually grow to a mountain throughout the whole earth. That the coming of the age to come is not an event, it is an event, a process, and a further event. 
That is, as Reformed theologians say, the kingdom is coming and still coming. It is here, it is now, because the king has died and risen and ascended and rules. It is here because the spirit is amongst us. We are in this new age, but it's a taste of the new age. It is not the entirety of the new age. That comes at the consummation. That comes at glorification. And so we use the language of now and not yet. Is God among his people? Absolutely now and not yet, not fully. It is, it is the glory of the age to come among us, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Yes, now and not fully yet. Is, is, the, is eternal life experienced by us now? Yes and not yet. Is sin put to death within us now? Yes and not yet. So the age of the Messiah, Peter understood as the Spirit came upon him at Pentecost, would not just be a single event and then the same for eternity, but it would come, the last days would be inaugurated, and then Jesus would come again and eradicate sin altogether after this worldwide mission of the church was undertaken through the preaching of the gospel. Peter spoke about this in his sermon on Pentecost. The very first Christian sermon tells to us, we're now in the last days. Peter, seeing the miracles and seeing the confused faces of his hearers, he says, guys, guys, remember, this is what Joel spoke of. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied when he said that in the last days, God would send his spirit upon all flesh. And Peter says, What you are seeing is that. Since the Spirit is among us, working upon all believers, since that is occurring here, we now know we're in the last days. And what did Joel say about the last days? That in that day it will be said, all who believe on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there was his application at that evangelical sermon. Since it is the last days, call on the Lord and be saved. That's still true today, and it'll be true until Jesus comes back. So, We are in the last days now. We are in the latter times. We are in the last chapter of human history until Jesus comes back. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says it this way. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. These last days beginning of church history, it was the last days. It is now the last days until Jesus comes back. And so what Paul is saying is, one of the markers that you must not be shocked by, though you're wounded by, you must not be surprised by, though you will be pained by, is the fact that certain people who professed Christ outwardly will in fact depart from the truth of the gospel all throughout the Christian era and age. This is the language of apostatizing. It says here, we'll depart from the faith. This is the language of falling away, of of veering away from, of turning around and pursuing something else. It was used in the Old Testament of the Israelites uh, reverting from their worship towards Yahweh, towards worship of idols. Turning and falling from their worship of the holy God to the worshiping of dead idols. That was the language of apostasy. And so it happens also today that that professing Christians turn their mind, turn their heart to false doctrine and false dogma and therefore apostatize. They fall away from the faith. The faith. The faith is language in the New Testament, not of your individual saving faith. You can't fall away from that. That's a gift from God. But the faith is the language of of, of the doctrine. It it might even be, in a modern day use of the term, uh, the religion of Christianity. We use this idea when when we talk about the Christian faith. The faith is something objective. It's a body of teachings. Jude says that it is the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It's the true statements, the true realities about what we believe and are saved. And it's that that Paul is saying. People will leave the faith. They will walk away from true confession. And this is interesting that he doesn't say... He doesn't say that in the latter times, certain people will leave the church. Because sometimes they do leave the church, and that would be true enough to say. But the dangerous fact is that people leave the faith and stay in the church. They leave the faith and keep preaching. They leave the faith, but they don't leave the ministry. 
They leave the faith, but they continue to lead the faith down its path towards hell and apostasy. So he's saying, not just that people will leave the church. Okay, that happens. People leave the visible church. He's saying, some people will stay in the visible church, but leave the invisible church. They'll be in communion with you, so you thought, in your membership, but they are not in communion with Christ, and they are therefore, in fact, false professors. So that's what. That's, the, that's what Paul is talking to us about in this passage today. <laughs> that was all these positive things that he said in chapter 3, verse 15, ending out last year. He said, we're the household of God. We're the church of the living God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't get so optimistic that you lose sight of the reality that this side of the resurrection, there are false bricks in this temple. And our job is to find them. So, he says here, the Spirit expressly says that in these last days, some will depart from the faith. The Spirit expressly says, your version might say, the Spirit explicitly told us. Now, where, where did the Spirit say that? Is Paul quoting something from the Old Testament? It's probable that he's actually referring to his own last word to the Ephesians before he left them back in Miletus. Back when he, uh, uh, after planting the church and laboring there for multiple years, he went away, he came back, he called an elders council meeting, and he told them then in Acts chapter 20, the Spirit tells me, I'm telling you, when I leave, false wolves will come up and speak twisted things. They will not speak altogether lies that don't even sound Christian. They'll speak the right things twisted. They'll speak twisted things and take followers after themselves and they will not spare the flock. He's probably referring to when the Spirit told them that through him. Maybe he's referring to his last letter to the Ephesian church, the book of Ephesians, where in chapter 6 he tells them that the fight of the local church is not mainly or, or, or primarily against other individuals, false professors, heretics or other religions, not people. Ultimately, our warfare, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul is telling us, therefore, that what he is addressing in false teaching and in errors of the church and in legalism that has come into the church is not only a fight against these false teachers. It's not merely a fight against the false pastors and false shepherds. It is mainly a fight with demons. So he said, he's basically quoting himself, the Spirit told us that people will fall away from the faith because demons infiltrate the ranks. That's what he says next in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. This is the how. This is the origin. Where do false teachings in the church that need to be eradicated by the truth of God's Holy Spirit, where do those errors come from? They come from demons. Now, it's not the case that human beings are so upright, holy, and marvelous in our natural state that if we're ever going to believe anything wrong, that it has to come from the satanic realm, it wouldn't come from human philosophy. That's not true. We have a, a pit of sin and error and folly inside of us. It's called philosophy. It's called man-made religion. Uh, but it is what the Bible says, folly. Nonetheless, what, what Paul is elevating our minds to understand is that the church is not simply having difficulties because human beings are thinking for themselves. He's saying you need to recognize that the chief reason the church has so many fiery darts aimed at her and has so many mines on her path, has so many rockets shooting towards her, is because she is what we just called her last chapter, the church of the living God. If the Babylonians sought to destroy, burn, and destroy the temple of Israel, of course, the, also the, the, the spiritual Babel, the devil, will send his forces against the temple of the living God in this age. If Jesus said of that temple, there will not be one brick left upon another because the forces of the Gentiles will destroy that Jerusalem temple, which happened in AD 70. Jesus has said, though my church I will build, and the gates of hell won't stand against it. But they will try. 
And while they are standing upon their gates, the forces of hell will shoot their arrows, pour their burning oil, cast down fiery arrows and spears and javelins and rocks upon the church as she marches forward in her kingdom ventures. She will not fail. She will be built. Jesus assured us of that. Nonetheless, the false teachings that come into the church are an attack of Satan himself by his forces. We, we need to understand even the, even the things that we've touched on, well, gone into some depth with some of them, but some of the things that Paul has st- spoken about in 1 Timothy already, like a return to Old Testament law as the primary uh, 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 primacy in a local church's preaching rather than gospel. That's the work of demons. Feminism coming into the church, equalizing leadership and giving women preaching opportunities. From Satan. Errors coming into the church. Disqualified leaders being allowed uh, sinful lives, but they can lead. Demonic attacks. Paul wants to elevate our ideas. If last week he elevated our, our, our consideration of what the church is, now he wants you to look upon the, the arrayed forces against us and say, don't think humanly about false teaching in the church's attacks. Think spiritually. Understand the might of her enemies. So, people will depart the faith because they devoted themselves, not just to their own thinking and psychologies, but because they devoted themselves, they followed after, they loved and started recommending for other people to read and started being quite evangelistic about the teachings of deceitful spirits and demons. Now, the question becomes in verse 2, how? How? Like, I've known some pretty undiscerning Christians in my time. Anybody with me? (laughs) I've known some pretty undiscerning churches in my time. A a leak in the air conditioning with some vapor coming out of it suddenly becomes, they think, the Shekinah glory visiting us here in full power. Right? No. Get a mechanic or something. We would think, okay, Paul's telling us that false teaching happens because demons start preaching in churches... Now, even the least discerning of churches would not see a fiery-tailed, pitchfork-cold and a a, a gulag-looking demon in the pulpit and then sit through that service. No, of course. Satan tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan, who can appear himself as an angel of light to Joseph Smith to create the demonic lying cult of Mormonism, or to others to bring about the lying death cult of Jehovah's Witness. Or the other angel of light who appeared to Muhammad to reveal to him the idiotic nonsense then printed out in the Quran. All of these demonic cults did not embody themselves as demons in front of people, but showed themselves as angels of light to a few, and then inspired those people to become teachers in front of others. So how does false teaching go from demons, go from the demon boardroom into churches, pulpits? It's through individuals who lose the spiritual sensitivity to right, wrong, sin, and righteousness. So look at what he says in verse 2. Here's how those lies came into the church. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Constantly throughout 1 Timothy, we've been reminded, this is like maybe the fourth, fifth time it's come up, clean conscience. This is essential to Christian living. This is esse- Even before we get into what you're eating, touching, watching, thinking, doing, we need to come back and the, one of the first principles of sanctification and your growth in Christ and your Christ-likeness is between you and God. Is there any known sin that you are tolerating, hiding, and allowing to grow like weeds? Is there some kind of putrefying piece of meat that you've hidden away in the corner of the room, hope it, you'll get back to it later, no one will know, but it's starting to fumigate its disgusting putrefaction through your household? If you use this analogy, is it like that, that your heart, your, your conscience is, is this altar before God upon which all good worship is placed, this spiritual altar of your soul, but, your, but a filthy conscience, tolerated sin, unrepented uh, unrighteousness in your life is like a smearing of pig's blood upon the altar. 
And you may bring pure things to God, a good song of praise, a generous gift of offering, a, a good deed done to a saint, a precious faith meal like communion, partaking in something good like baptism. But they come and being placed upon the altar of your conscience, they are putrefied because you are tolerating sin in your life. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, if your conscience is not clean, if you are tolerating unrepentant sin, don't take of the Lord's Supper. Conscience is everything. It's not as if conscience is the authority, that if you're against the law but okay with conscience, that's fine. No, the law informs conscience, God's authority first. But friends, do you have a clean conscience before the Lord? Are you tolerating Lies, errors, lies to your spouse, uh, mistreatment of family, mismanagement of funds, uh, 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 bad speech, uh, uh, immoral entertainment that that causes temptation and lust, but you make make room for it in your heart. This This is a dirty conscience. Now, already, Paul has told us in chapter one that true biblical gospel ministry issues forth through the, through the floodgates of true love, of a genuine faith, a good heart, and, and, a, and a clean conscience. So let's say this. If you're in ministry and trying to preach and proclaim the truth and evangelize and do God's great commission work with a filthy conscience, know that you will be buffeted and restricted in your fruit. Also, elders and deacons are said that they need to have a good conscience. So... Now, it's quite official. It's very serious. If you don't have a clean conscience, you can't be an elder or a deacon. But even before that, even, even worse than those threatenings, or maybe, maybe those things you can do without. Okay, I don't want to be an elder anyway. I'm not much about the Great Commission anyway. And now it's even more serious. In this passage, Paul says that if you are tolerating an unclean conscience, you're not bringing it to the Lord in confession, you are not repenting, You are tolerating the presence of sin in your life as a discipline. You refuse to put up with it. Then now you may in fact be a chasm, a crack, a space in the wall through which enemies, demonic teaching and errors may slip. Paul says that the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, they're the, they're the aven, avenue through which the demonic uh, teaching comes. Now we see in 2 Timothy that sometimes true Christians can be taken for a time to do the devil's bidding. Now don't think possession. Don't think the exorcist. Don't think floating six feet above the ground and speaking backwards in Latin making the lights flicker. No, it it simply means that you yourself, and I've known this, I've known people like this, they can be an avenue, a vessel for false teaching, for sin and error in a local church, even though they are owned by Christ. And Paul says, confront them lovingly, hoping, praying that God will grant them repentance and a return to the truth. But it is also the case that this is the activity of false believers in the church. This is what marked false believers. This is what marks... You, if you're an unbeliever, and you know this, you'll hear what we say here and you say, this this describes my entire soul. Here it is. As a, the difference is not just an unclean conscience. Paul is talking about a seared conscience, and that's the next step. Because an unclean conscience can be wiped clean by confession and repentance and prayer and, 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 and changing. Right, that Your conscience is now clean, or a return to, the, to our shepherd. A seared conscience is what happens when that sin remains long enough to burn and to cauterize your conscience so that it stops even being sensitive to the errors and sins. Searing is, you know, some of you guys are cooks and you know how to sear some meat. It's no longer soft and sensitive. You sear it so that it becomes hard and crusty. Uh, Some of you are in the medical world and you know what it is to cauterize a wound. A wound that won't organically heal itself in the normal healthy way of of sealing off its own capillaries to stop losing blood. If it continues to open, then the unideal solution is to take either a a laser blade or some some hot uh, uh, implement to that to sear it, to burn it and sizzle the flesh so that it stops bleeding. And it's unideal to do that because not only does it stop the bleeding, it stops all future feeling at that site as well. 
Some of you have, have scars maybe on your arm, your, your neck, your head, your legs, your, your, your fingers. And you know that the, the, the feeling, the sensation of nerves is different there. That's what Paul is saying. That that can happen to somebody's conscience. You stop even feeling the, the spiking of sin anymore. You know, you, you start taking shots of, of, of sin like tequila and it burns and it burns. And then eventually you can drink a whole bottle and you're fine. And it's a dangerous, dangerous thing that Paul wants us to consider here today. I know that you're here on a Sunday probably professing to be a Christian. I know that most of us are covenant members here at this church. Most of you may well have been baptized and most of you will probably take communion later. I wonder though, are you here with a seared conscience, a dirty conscience, a false profession, and right now today you need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time? Or are you a Christian that has tolerated this unchristian like behavior in your life, and today you need to repent, confess, come to the Lord God who loves you and saved you and offers you new mercies every single day regardless of the sin? Come to him today in this way. Paul has told us, this is how these demonically originated lies get into the church. We all just put up with our own sin. Some who are unsaved particularly are taken by Satan to do his bidding. And look at the results. Look at verse 3. Here's what this big, scary, horrible, cosmically devilish effect on the church is, right? Here's, here's what it looks like. They tell you it's better to stay single and they tell you you're a sinner for eating certain foods or drinks. That sounds pretty ordinary, doesn't it? That's just your fundamentalist uncle. That's not too bad, is it? That's just, that's, that's just my, my, my... It's not, it's not sin, it's not demonic error, it's a quirk. It's just a quirky church. No, no, they've been infiltrated. Forbid marriage and require abstinence from certain foods. Some of you are saying, hang on, hang on. This sounds like Catholicism. Bingo, demonic teaching. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This sounds like a, a radical Seventh-day Adventism. Bingo. Erroneous, deceitful spirits teaching those things. Hang on, hang on. This sounds like my, 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 my Judaistic, uh, 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 Hebrew-Israelite type uh, uh, background. Yep. Deceitful spirits when it's coming into the church. That's what happened in Galatia and Colossae and other places. First Corinthians, uh, the, the, the church of Corinth. When te false teaching comes in, it doesn't present itself as everything wrong. It twists the truth, becoming error. It distracts you from the first principles, focuses you on the second principles, changes the first principles while you're not looking, brings you back to them, and everything's different. In other words, well, the devil is always offering in his white suit and tie as a respectful preacher, as a uh, progressive Christian who sure does love Jesus and all the rest, uh, uh, as the devil presents himself to the church, he's never offering Satanism. Right? He's like, he's like, it, it doesn't sell very well at church, right? Satanism doesn't do too well out in the foyer, even if it's out for free. What Satan always offers for you is godliness. Satan offers the most godly godliness you've ever seen. The most Christ-like Christ-likeness you've ever laid eyes upon. The most angelic living style, the most perfect Christian life you've ever seen is available if you just do dot, dot, dot. Satan's always offering godliness. Because uh, Don't you want to be sinless? Don't you want to be more righteous? Aren't you sick of your sin? Well, Galatians, I'll tell you, if you get circumcised and do the Moses law, then you'll be more holy. Then you'll be saved, secure, pure. Oh, don't you just wish that you could, you could be more powerful against the forces of darkness and do good for Jesus? I've got an angel that you can commune with. Oh, yes, godliness is on offer. If you come into our trances and our, and our circles of prayer and our seances and we will experience the divine. Oh, you want spiritual power? Oh, I've got an anointing I can throw upon you. Yes, come and stand upon this old grave or come and listen to this incantation and there it will be. Oh, you, you want to know God more deeper, have, have this overwhelming strength of knowledge and the word doesn't do it for you. Oh, I've got some direct downloads for you. Oh, oh I've got a, a re, a recantations that you can, uh, you can do. I've got other books outside of the Bible that you can add to your understanding. Oh, you want to be godly? I've got some Old Testament law for you. I've got some Israelite law for you if you'd like that. 
Oh, you want to be more godly because sexual sin is overtaking you. Leave your family. It's better to be single. It's far more holy to be single. You know who else was single? Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, because his whole life purpose was to die and marrying a woman and leaving that behind would be a bad husband move. It's because he literally has a cosmic bride called the church and you're not in it. Right? Oh, you know who else was single? Paul. No, probably not. Now, he was probably married because you have to be married to be on the Sanhedrin, like it seems he was. He was probably either a widower or she left and divorced him once he converted. Who knows? But then he was single. Yes, he was an apostle and he said to us, there are exceptions for marriage. Sometimes if life is far too dangerous in mission, like you're going to go uh, preach Christ in Afghanistan, don't propose to a lady and take her along with you so that she gets butchered on day two. Leave her behind. Go and suffer in sing- a singleness like Paul, unless it's too tempting for you. Uh, uh, and so Paul, uh, uh, people come and they come up with these additional rules to get you godliness that just plain old spirit-filled living doesn't get you. So offering godliness, in Ephesus what it looked like was forbidding marriage, preferring singleness, and abstaining from certain foods. There's two possible, if you'll bear with me, two possible historical influence for this. It's hard to know because history is... Uh, uh, 2,000 years old and it's hard hard to know, but it's probably a Jewish influence and a Greek influence. From the Jewish side, they have uh, this group called the Essenes, okay? These are the, this is like the the Jesus Revolution hippie Christians. This is like the Jewish version of that. They all, they let their hair grow long. They uh, 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 wore, you know, animals clothing. They lived out in the wilderness and they were asceticists, meaning pleasure is bad. Most of the world you can touch, see, and handle, pretty sinful. Don't have fun, don't have joy, don't pleasure yourself. And so they actually believe that you should not get married, you should not have children. Do I need to tell you it was a very short-lived movement? (laughs) Probably from the Greek side was the influence of asceticism, not enjoying or embracing the worldly system, or overindulging because your spirit is good, made by the good God, And flesh, matter, physical things is evil made by the evil God. They had this yin-yang dualism in different sort of manifestations in the ancient world. People still have it today. And so they felt, they held that, 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 that physical is bad. Don't engage in it. Sex, food, marriage, physical, bad. Spirit, good. Uh, uh, Angels, good. And what Paul uh, instructs us to realize is no, there are evil spirits. Half the spirit realm is evil. Uh, People are either spiritually good or spiritually evil. We need to understand that. Also, physical is good. The physical world is good. In Genesis 3, when God cursed the world because of Adam's sin, did all of the created realm become sinful? No. Sons of Adam became sinful. Human beings became sinful. The world became cursed and so became difficult and deadly. Food did not become sinful. Rainbows, uh, waterfalls, grass, walking stakes with hooves. They're called cows in some parts of the world. Uh, uh, Sheep, uh, wine, grapes, uh, certain uh, green leaves. Are they sinful to touch, handle, sew into clothes, use as food or whatever else? No. You know who's sinful? You and I. That's what Jesus said. He said to the Pharisees, you would wash certain ways and abstain from certain foods. He says, it's not creation that's sinful, it's you. You can take the best thing and sin with it. You can take uh, a dangerous thing and glorify God with it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, you can take meat that a pagan has sacrificed to Satan and sprinkled with demon juice. You can take that, say thank you Jesus, and eat up to the glory of God. It is not the material things that are evil. It is our use of them. That means that we can take anything in creation and enjoy it to God's glory. So so here, if we can get back to the context of the passage, demons teach liars with with seared consciences to add laws into the church so that they are limited in their ability to enjoy God's world because legalism has embraced them. Demons bring lies, which brings legalism. And the opposite is true in a spirit-filled church. The spirit teaches us truth 
and people with clean consciences receive, believe, and proclaim that truth. And what does that create? Not legalism, a joyful reception of God's gifts, both in creation and in Christ. Here's the big issue with legalism like this about what foods you're allowed to drink or eat, what things you're allowed to wear, listen to, what colors you're allowed to uh, paint your house or wear to church or whatever else. You know the problem with that? It's a faulty view of creation and it's a faulty view of salvation. On salvation, they're saying Jesus is just such a weak, pathetic, impotent failure of a savior that if you drink the wrong carbonated fermented juice, you'll go to hell. What a weak Jesus you've got. What a pathetic salvation you profess to believe in if touching certain things, eating certain meats, or drinking certain drinks gets you unsaved or unholy. You have such a weak view of Jesus. But also, it's a bad view of creation. Legalists like this, who believe that there's evil in certain foods or, or, or materials or drinks or something like marriage, the joining together of flesh... They happen to believe, whether they admit it or not, they believe that God created some of the world and Satan created the rest. And what is the Christian confession? That God and God alone created all the world good, including Lucifer, the good angel, who later fell. It is not that God created some and the devil created some, so only do the stuff that God created and don't touch the stuff that Satan created, because Satan created legalism as well. Nonetheless, we see in Genesis 1, God makes the plants, and what does he say? It is good. He makes the animals, the future barbecue materials, and he says, this is good. And then he makes man and woman and tell them, get together in covenant, make babies and have fun doing it, raising them, being fruitful. And he said, this is very good. And marriage, food, all of God's world is to be enjoyed and received, and that's what Paul says in verse, the end of verse 3 and 4. He says, here's a biblical doctrine of creation. God created all things, the foods to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. If you don't believe and know the truth, you think there's some, some evil material out there. You think Satan created the world too. No, we who believe and know the truth know that this whole world is my father's world. That means I can glorify him touching, doing, using anything. Paul says, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. He says, if you're not a believer, you can enjoy the same things I can enjoy in life, but it's capped. Your enjoyment terminates on the thing. Uh, I enjoy the same meals, the same drinks you do, but I receive it with an upturned heart to Jesus saying, thank you for this grace I'm not worthy of, but I enjoy it's like you're a kid at the playground who's playing around, has your fun, slides the slide, walks away, goes, you don't know who built it. A Christian is somebody in God's world who comes to the playground and says, my dad made this. And my dad stands next to me as I play on the playground and he shows me other things that I can play on and he lifts me up and helps me have more fun and with every joyful slide ride, I turn to my father and say, I love you, thank you. That's the Christian life. There's no portions of the world God made that we're not allowed to touch or enjoy. There are things we're not allowed to do with the playground, like hit my brother over the head with the plastic slide. Tremendous fun. Sin. We can sin with the world God made for us, but we can also enjoy everything God made for us as long as it is received with thanksgiving. It is good. Look at verse 4. For everything God created is good. Everything. Everything. And nothing is to be rejected. Nothing. If it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. You know what this doesn't mean? This doesn't mean you have to say certain graces or chants or or read scripture over your meal for it to then be a blessing unto you. Right? Fine to pray grace. I do it every meal. It is good. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that the word of God, which makes God's world holy and beneficial to us, the word of God which sanctified it as a gift to us was the word of God at creation, which spoke it into being, which said, this is good for my people and for my glory. God's word by creation made everything good. And now in new creation and in salvation, we have such a rich, robust, 
embodied, glorious salvation in Jesus. That means that we don't need to worry about legalism, touching, tasting, handling, drinking, and losing our salvation because of it. We need to be rock solid, standing, believing and confessing the truth. And our message is Jesus. He saved me, not me. Not drinking certain things didn't save me, so drinking certain things can't unsave me. But if I'm in Jesus, I will live godly, and that's next week's passage. Legalism grows where a, where a knowledge, a robust, professing knowledge of the, of the gospel disappears from a people. Again, remember the process. Demons bring lies into the church through people with bad consciences, and it results in legalism that looks like godliness. The way God would have it is that the Holy Spirit enlivens our hearts to profess the truth of Christ with clean consciences so that we can enjoy God's good creation together. Together. Legalism grows where the gospel is forgotten. Dumb rules grow in churches where the gospel is forgotten. Let me tell you a story. Very quick story. Just the other night, I was driving home. And I needed to pull over for a quick second in order to organize something. And uh, I had pulled into a little car wash, like a bit, pretty big car wash, like an industrial big car wash. And as I'm sitting there in the driveway, I look over to the road and I see this big sign hanging right over the, over the car wash. No muddy cars allowed. <laughs> That's a disgruntled manager who's sick of his job. <laughs> when at a car wash, you say... No muddied cars allowed. <laughs> That's what happens in churches who forget the point of their existence. Washing, receiving, adding sinners to Jesus Christ. They say things like, no sinners allowed. In fact, no people who eat certain meats, no people who are getting married. Here's all my stupid, idiotic rules because I'm sick of dealing with the very point of my existence, which is sinners. Verse 15 in chapter 1 said, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So church, embrace, remember the gospel. And when other people, there's sin around us, or, or new people coming in and they still have sinful practices, don't start making up dumb rules. Remember the gospel. Apply the gospel. Receive, believe the gospel. It says that Jesus came into the world for sinners, to save sinners. Which means that today, if if you've realized you're not a Christian, you do see your conscience, you hide from God, you hate his word, you profess this fake godliness about you with legalism, you need to hear this good news. Jesus came to save you. He didn't come to help your efforts so you can save yourself. He didn't come to save renovated sinners. He didn't come to save sinners who at least are showing some measure of self-help. No. No. He came to save you in the muck and the mire. He came to save corpses and give them new life. He doesn't ask for help. He tells you, stop your doing. By my death, I've paid for your sin. By my perfect life and glorious resurrection, I have earned your way to heaven. Believe in Jesus, friends. That is your only way to God. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We thank you. We exalt you for your goodness shown to us in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that we have seen with our eyes, some of us, or we have at least heard from Paul's pen, the kind of dangers that come into the church, the kind of errors that assault the church. And we acknowledge that we have seen people depart from the faith and some even left the church. Father God, we acknowledge therefore the dangers we are in if we don't have a good conscience. We acknowledge the dangers we are in if we are not a church founded upon this truth of Jesus Christ. We know the dangers we are involved with if we fail to be a pillar and buttress of the truth of the gospel. So I pray therefore, Lord God, you would glorify yourself in our midst by saving sinners. You would convince them right now in their own soul and in their own heart that there is nothing they need to do because there is nothing they can do. Please give them a heart that simply leans on the merits of Jesus, leans on the power of Jesus to save and receive salvation right now. Please enable us to, 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 to rest on Jesus' promises for the church, to rely on Jesus as the power and the strength of the church so that we're not adding laws and silly legalistic rules. I pray all those, Lord, who have placed their faith in you, who are seeking to live with a pure conscience, would you give to them a pure, unadulterated, undefiled, strong and powerful 
assurance of their salvation. Would you please remind them the rock upon which they stand? Would you remind them of the power of the blood that has washed them? Would you please give to us an assurance of our salvation in Jesus Christ that we might glorify you rightly? We pray all of these things in his wonderful name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen.